Hello, Anna Sabramowitz here from eLearnerEngage.com and next I've got an interview for you with Sergei Snagirev, who is the CEO and founder of BranchTrack.com. Now listen, he dropped some knowledge bombs that will take you professionally to the next level as far as I'm concerned. So watch it from beginning to end, it's about an hour. If you do need to skip to sections, which I don't recommend, you can do that underneath the video, but watch it from beginning to end and enjoy because it is pro probably one of the best interviews uh, that I've had in a very long time. So see you at the end. All right, so um, let us get started. Okay, Sergey, thank you so much, so much for, uh, for being here today. And um, I'm basically the next hour, we're just going to uh, talk about what you do, your philosophy, and um, our audience is novice instructional designers and people who want to get into, um, into e-learning or who are already maybe transitioning and want to start designing their own learning. And so I think you're perfect for this because you have so much experience. So um, let me just introduce you officially. Sergey is the CEO and founder of BranchTrack, the easiest and friendliest online tool for creating branching scenarios. Before that, Sergey worked as a managing partner in an e-learning development company that he co-founded in 2008, where he was responsible for ideating, designing, and developing dozens of online courses for all kinds of corporate customers from airlines to finance to healthcare. Sounds awesome. And Sounds about right. <laughs> Considering you wrote it, yeah, it sounds fantastic. Now, <laughs> the, the quote on LinkedIn, because I always go to check out people, and I love this quote um, that you have on your profile. It says, I created BranchTrack.com, a cool online tool for creating interactive dialogues. I love that. And we think that linear training and authoring tools with PowerPoint mentality should become extinct. That, I love that even more. Drop me a line if you're interested in the future of online learning. That's solid. So um, <laughs> it sounds like you're, uh, you have a, you've drawn a line and you want that line to start becoming re a reality, right? Because I think, anyways, we'll talk about some of the things that definitely um, we need to maybe set some ground rules for e-learning that haven't been set before. But first, um, for somebody who's very new to this, uh, can you explain to me what scenarios are or what these, um, what do you call them, uh, these interactive dialogues, what they are to you? So uh, scenarios are situations that you put your learners in and uh, if those situations are realistic then your learners will get the chance to apply the theoretical knowledge they're getting from your courses in these realistic uh, situations. It's like um, um, in aviation training, you have you know a ton of theory that you have to learn, you know yes. how to operate a million buttons and so on. <laughs> but uh, before you actually get to fly the real plane, you have this simulation experience, right, where you yeah. can uh, screw up as many situations as as you want in a safe, simulated environment, and only then you get to fly the real thing, right? So we don't see enough of that in uh, e-learning. And uh, uh, that's sad. In, in most cases, it's like, well, here's the ton of theory, and the next thing you get is to actually do the real job. Yeah. And if it's like, and if that job is linked to uh, sales, for example, you get to lose clients and lose deals and hurt brands sometimes, and so on. And the way we remedy it usually is with more training. You yeah. Know, like, you don't perform, well, you're either fired or you get more training. So what we're trying to do is to bring in that simulation piece into, into the training process to bridge that gap between uh, the theoretical training, the, you know, like the hundred slides with the do's and don'ts, and the actual job performance that people expect of you. So uh, scenarios are those situations, the simulated uh, situations that uh, uh, help learners uh, apply those skills. So Does that make sense? It makes sense to me, but I'm just thinking that there's a lot of people out there who say things like, oh, I've created a scenario, but really what they're doing is they're just um, telling a story. Okay. Right? Like, you've seen these these e-learning modules where they're like, oh, look, it's a scenario, and I'm basically it's they're telling me a story, but there's no um, decision points for me. I'm just, I, maybe the assumption is that somebody would just passively learn through this contextual story 
without actually having to make decisions. And I, it seems like, go ahead, sorry. Yeah, well, this is this is exactly uh, this is exactly it. Uh, the whole point is putting the learner into the driver's seat, right? Yeah. Giving them the choice, uh, enabling them to make a decision. So, uh, and in a way, it is storytelling. Yeah. It's more like. Uh, you know, if if you ever played those uh, uh, build your own adventure kind of books in nineteen eighties and nineteen nineties, yeah. very little, but uh, I wish I had more. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, the uh, it's uh, it's like that. So you tell a story, and then you stop and uh, uh, you ask, like, what should we do now? Um, let's say um, your colleague is uh, obviously depressed she's been crying whole morning and uh, you're her manager so uh, you have to do something about it yeah. uh, what would you do and then you give choices and uh, uh, just as that situation should feel real to the learners the choices sh should be realistic as well well you can ignore it um, you can uh, uh, yell at her and tell her to get to work and you know leave her you know personal problems at home and you know I've, I've once in my life I had a boss like that. Never <laughs> did a corporate job after all. Uh, or you can uh, ask her what's happening. And these are the three choices that you want your learner to choose from. And uh, when they do that, you can't give them feedback. What you have to do for, for the scenario to, uh, to work, you have to show the consequence. So you can't say uh, when the learner chooses, let's yell at her. You can't say, we don't yell, it's against our corporate policy. You say, okay, so you yelled at, at, at her and now she is uh, uh, crying, but also everyone else around you stopped working and trying to comfort her. And what do you do next? And this whole set of choices uh, is obviously very different from uh, the choices you would have seen if, if you chose any other path in the very beginning. So this is branching, this is decisions, and this is what differs the story from a scenario. The story is passive. It's like watching a movie. You know, you, it, it's a ride along. You, you're yeah. just following. But uh, in a scenario, uh, the learner has the power to make that decision. And uh, he also has the responsibility to face the consequences. And you, as an instructional designer, you show those consequences. You say, okay, now everyone is watching you. What, what, what do you do? Now you can either say you're sorry and try to back out of that situation, or you can uh, yell at everyone else this time and see what happens. Mm -hmm. And as a learner, you know, you can try that. The fun part of scenarios is that they are obviously not real. So you can try stuff that you wouldn't otherwise try. And again, much like in aviation training, uh, it's the whole point uh, sometimes to let you try scenarios that you wouldn't otherwise dare to try in real life and show you the consequences and let you uh, kind of feel and live through those consequences uh, uh, in, in a form of, you know, it could be anything from storytelling to video or to cartoons and so on. But, uh, yeah, I think the decision points in, in the story is what makes scenarios different. I like how you said that the responsibility falls to the learner because I feel like there's a lot of learning and training out there that all of a sudden you are you're just a passive bystander and you're supposed to absorb things but adding that responsibility piece is uh is so interesting because you want you in most cases you want that success to happen and it is up to you it's not somebody else telling you how to do it so i really i really like that i like i'm gonna like quote you and tweet you out for that responsibility part because i think it's really important um okay so now that we're able to build uh, these kinds of scenarios with a tool like BranchTrack, for someone who is new to developing e-learning, um, can you tell me like, can you tell me how scenarios are changing learning? Because you said you mentioned, uh, you know, the cockpit got, cockpit of a plane, and that's where people see scenarios and simulations that's kind of been the realm because the military has been very, you know, efficient at that. But um, how do you see that changing how we do e-learning? Well, uh, in, in, in my opinion, uh, scenarios aren't just changing e-learning, they are becoming e-learning, or maybe e-learning is becoming scenarios because uh, 
that uh, uh, if, if, if you think about the PowerPoint, it comes from uh, just the technical limitation of that slide projector <laughs> that had this mechanical queue of slides uh, that you had to preload and then show them one by one, right? Yeah. Um, and that kind of predates that. That that goes back to those uh, uh, days when uh, you had you know one book per hundred people, and therefore only one of them could read it out loud, and everyone else had to listen. Right? Those were so, great days. Come on. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I I have a I have a strong feeling that about maybe seventy five to eighty percent of uh, current instructional designers would love to live in those times. I I mean. <laughs> They still live in those times. I think you're right. I think you're it's, right. <laughs> uh, and, and I personally, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm, I'm a huge fan of video games. I'm a huge fan of interactive media. I'm a huge fan of, uh, of technology as such. And uh, when I was first exposed to uh, what people called learning, it was about like one, eight, nine years ago, I was like amazed at 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 how dated it all feels in 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 uh, uh, in what uh, in instructional approaches. I didn't know they were called instructional approaches or instructional design and, at that point, but I just felt that something was wrong. That I wasn't engaged. And so when we started building uh, e-learning, and we knew like nothing about it, uh, and and we still had to kind of win contracts and so on. So we just uh, um, tried to fall back on. Uh, uh, whatever we knew and me and my guys we knew video games so we started building those kind of uh, first person experiences where uh, you as a learner have to uh, confront um, clients if, if, we, if we're talking about salespeople training yeah. or uh, employees if we're talking about management training or patients or grieving relatives if we're talking about healthcare scenarios and so on and uh, uh, we naturally felt that the learner has to do something inside that e-learning and not just sit and listen or sit and read or sit and click next. And uh, uh, this is how we got into the whole uh, scenario business and uh, uh, then we struggled to find a tool and then we built a tool and we made it public and so on. But uh, I have a strong feeling that this is... Um, uh, uh, changing and that everyone is now uh, recognizing the power of, of scenarios and it's like uh, it's a bit like f uh, I don't know feminism maybe when suddenly the world is changing and the uh, everyone around uh, is starting recognizing that things aren't what they used to be and they shouldn't be like that and now the learners have the power you know like we had girl power now it's learner power <laughs> when, uh, when, when learners don't want to sit and listen anymore they want to do stuff they want to click stuff they want to uh, experience stuff and be engaged by it otherwise they disengage because there are so many things for them to do outside of your course you know they have anything from Facebook on their phone to a million emails uh, on, on, on their computer computer to sometimes customers waiting online and, and so on. And uh, the only way we can kind of compete with that if uh, we uh, agree that they should have that choice in, 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 and, and they should have that experience and they should be engaged uh, instead of uh, just sitting there and listening to us. You know, we're not teaching school children after all. We're usually teaching adults. Yeah. Um, so uh, uh, I, I feel like this is a big thing already and it's just going to be bigger. Um, it's When you were talking about all those other things, experiences that uh, people are exposed to that is now, in essence, kind of competing for attention, and it's funny because all those other platforms like YouTube and Facebook, they are contextual. They are so catered to that person's needs, wants, desires, likes. And so I, it, it's, it's almost like we really have to push that reality, that context, that relevance, because everything else is already picked that up, right? So we are, we're behind because we're, we're making it so vanilla almost that it becomes, a lot of it is so vanilla that it, it loses its, its effect. So, yeah. So, okay. Um, you mentioned um, you mentioned a couple of awesome uh, examples already. Things like you know uh, the healthcare industry dealing with grief uh, or telling patients. This is a phenomenal scenario. I think there's so many doctors who don't have, you know, uh, 
bedside manner or maybe the the problem is that they experience or they make decisions but they don't actually see the consequences of those decisions later on they're just it's so random and removed so what industry do you feel is um, maybe would benefit or has the biggest opportunity in scenarios and maybe not using them to their full advantage Ooh, well <laughs> you're probably um, gonna say everybody <laughs> well um yeah everybody of course uh, there are certain industries that uh probably don't need as many scenarios mm -hmm. um maybe technical training, software training, uh, although we, uh, even with our tool, we see that uh, people are still trying to use that. It's not really thought for software training, but we see a lot of people who try to build software training uh, in, 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 in a way which gives the learner the choice of what they want to be trained on, uh, kind of like here's a 30 second overview of our platform. Now, what do you want to learn about next? About publishing or about authoring or about collaborating with others? Um, okay, then the guy clicks collaborating and he watches the part that he's interested in. And then once he watched that, we can ask him again, well, so what do you want? Uh, do you want to uh, learn more about this particular subject or you want to go back and, and uh, explore other subjects and so on? And uh, that keeps the learner again. I, I guess the key word of, of the evening is uh, engaged and, uh, and tapping uh, even, into content that they find uh, meaningful or they want to learn more about. So it gives them more exactly, autonomy. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. But this is kind of the uh, least uh, uh, if efficient, probably, end yeah. of the spectrum. Uh, on the more efficient way is anything that's centered around dialogues, because dialogues are always choices, mm -hmm. and dialogues are always challenging. And in real life, if you don't explore certain uh, dialogue choices, uh, you'll you'll never know what happens, right? You uh, let's say uh, a hot topic is, for example, dealing with angry customers, right? <laughs> Uh, because dealing with customers who are happy with your product is easy, right? Yeah. You ask them what they want and you sell them that thing. And sometimes you ask, like, would they like anything else? And, and they will probably buy that as well. But if the customer is really pissed, that's, that's a problem. And this is where usually people don't know how to react because they're afraid. Uh, they uh, are afraid of trying different approaches. So it's a subject that is very difficult to figure out on their own. They have to be trained on it. But if we are training them by just exposing them to do's and don'ts, uh, to, to corporate policies or to samples of conversations recorded in, in, in role play between you know two actors or something, then uh, the learners don't really connect with that. They don't trust your information in many cases, and sometimes they will say, well, it, it, it won't work, and they dismiss it. Because uh, also, uh, usually it's not the high priority area for them. They, they don't think that uh, you know, it's, it's really important to know that stuff. But if you give them the choice, if you say, well, here's the customer who's essentially shouting at you, what do you do? Do you shout back? Do you just shut up and not say anything? Do you just ignore them? Or maybe you ask this question or that question, and you can explore those things. And you suddenly discover that one of those things actually makes the guy come down, and in, our, in, in the case of our software, we have this emotion meter which, which uh, drops uh, when the person is angry or goes up to the green area if the person is calm. So you can visually see that, wow, that guy is, is coming down. And uh, what if I try and say this thing now? Oops, the, the meter just dropped. I, I, I probably should go back and, and try something else. And you are in control. You feel empowered because what? That guy is just a virtual character. You know, you can restart or close that guy anytime you want. Uh, unlike, you know, in the real client situation, so um, people really connect with with uh, uh, such uh, such scenarios. And I think if we explore some uh, like serial, serious topics, anything from telling your employees uh, that they're fired or uh, hard subjects like uh, uh, talking to your colleagues about sexual harassment in the office, for example. Like, how do you tell that guy to stop? Uh, and, you know, you, you don't get a lot of chances to explore different conversation options, hopefully. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yes, hopefully not. But you're right. Uh, it's, it, it's like it's, you're, you're synthesizing those high-intensity, high, um, high, uh, high error moments 
uh, into these uh, into these scenarios so that somebody can explore without yeah. feeling yeah and maybe getting better next time I like the idea you you included the um, um, and I and I thought about this because in branch track what you do include is that you have a choice of when you're having a conversation that beside the person you can see that um, their emotional, emotional meter right and I thought initially I was like oh I don't know but but then you have the option to turn it off and I was thinking that maybe that's something that you would uh, let a novice learner who really is just trying to feel it out to really have them like you're teaching them, you know, the right approach. And that's a really clear indication of whether they're being successful or not. And maybe that's something that you might even remove later as they get more advanced to see how their conversation go and if they're more astute at reading or working through those conversations. So I like that. I didn't think about it that way before, but now that you talk about it, I was like, yeah, I could see that. I could see that actually being really helpful to people, especially in new situations because they're, uh, the uh, frustration you can only frustrate people so long right until um until they uh, they give up so that's awesome um now okay um i think that there's this misconception that people feel like oh look this tool helps me um you know photoshop helps me do this now i can create these masterpieces and if uh, i I'm, I'm thinking that people go get into branch track and they're like, oh yeah, look, it's a scenario thing. I'm going to make amazing scenarios, right? Like yeah. off the start, I, I have a piece of paper. This, this is write. what we sell. This is what we sell. <laughs> we will tell you that you can make amazing scenarios just by our tool. <laughs> so, okay. I'm uh, Okay. That's cool. But um, I'm sure there is, uh, there's better strategies uh, versus worse strategies. So uh, what's, based on what you've seen from your users, what are, what's the number one mistake people make uh, that are new to e-learning when they start working with software like BranchTrack or uh, when they try to design a scenario and how to avoid it? <laughs> okay, so uh, number one mistake is uh, too much. Too much text and sometimes too much choice. So uh, this is probably number one question we get from anyone who is uh, uh, beginning their first project. It's... Uh, uh, Okay, my uh, character speech bubble is now overlapping the uh, choice <laughs> buttons, and there's a screenshot attached to, to 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 that email, and we're like, okay, there we go again. Uh, breathe in, breathe out. Let's explain. And what we try to explain is that uh, you can't uh, 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 just push a wall of text uh, to, to in in the face of your learners and expect them to read it and be engaged with it. And you can't uh, equally uh, overload them with number of choices mm -hmm. uh, that you're offering because sometimes people say, well, uh, you know, we have these uh, amazing 15 strategies of dealing with the crisis in our company. So here they are all on screen and, uh, well, why don't you choose one? And uh, we always say, now, like, imagine how would you talk to a real person. Like, you say one phrase and then you wait for their input. Maybe it's a nod of the head, maybe they just say, okay, go on. Uh, or, or they agree that they understand or they want to butt in and ask, like, okay, I have this other question. So this is how you want to build a, a, a scenario which is centered around conversation. Short phrases in a very realistic language, uh, uh, please no corporate speak. And uh, if you are providing choices, make sure that, A, you have choice and it's not just linear where, you know, instead of scenario, you just have a set of uh, con conversational phrases. Uh, but don't provide more than, than necessary. Like usually three, four choices is plenty enough to think about. And if you have 15 strategies, well, uh, you can probably group them in, you know, three, four groups. And then you can say, well, which group of strategies would you choose for that particular challenge and once the learner chooses one you can say okay now in that group we have four strategies now which one of them would you choose and so on uh, in, instead of saying okay here's 15 choices and here's seven paragraphs of text uh, deal with it yeah, yeah. so um, that's number one mistake people make put too much on a single slide uh, too much text and too much choice uh, we always say you know, take it easy spread it over uh, learner is not going to run away from you especially if you keep them you know uh, in, engaged bit by bit they will just immerse in your scenario more as, as a result instead of being scared away closing it down and saying okay I'll complete the quiz instead yeah 
It's funny um, you say that because I think uh, one of the things I found in scenarios is that you're almost like, you should almost look at movie scripts and see how the screenwriters write, right? Because there's that, that flow, but also the, the options. I remember doing a workshop and somebody said, well, life has infinite options, so how can you give people options because what if there's options that you haven't thought of and I thought there's this uh, one study done on a lady that was selling jam and she had uh, five jams and then the next week she sh oh no she had four jams or something like anyway a small amount of jams then the next week she put out 15 different kinds of jams and she sold less when she had 15 jams out on display because people couldn't make a decision because it was overwhelming and so this is, to me, this is perfect advice because it's, it works, it, those limited numbers and choices work with, work for almost every industry where you just, and you're right. The other thing is that your scenarios are probably trying to uh, reinforce some kind of, uh, some kind of way of thinking, some kind of approach. So you don't want to give people infinite choices. You want to give them maybe the most difficult choices that most people mess up on, right? Um, you probably want to give them the realistic choices because uh, if they uh, don't find the choice that they find uh, that they think of as reasonable, yeah, uh, because you think it's not a reasonable choice, so why put it there? It's wrong anyway. Mm. So if you only put the right choices on there, uh, the learners will not engage with your scenario. They will uh, they will uh, start criticizing it uh, and and they will say, okay, you know, in real life it never happens like that. Real people never say anything like that. And if I were in that situation, I, I would do this and that. And you know, it's not on screen, so why should I even care about that? The guy who, sure. who created obviously doesn't know the first thing about my job. So um, it's uh, it's it's important to uh, uh, create scenarios in close collaboration with uh, subject matter experts. Yeah. And uh, the truth uh, is, actually, subject matter experts love scenarios. They love telling stories. Yes. And they, they, they uh, are easily uh, uh, persuaded. immersed, <laughs> persuaded, yeah, yeah, to, to, to do a scenario. Once you show them one, one, one or two things, they, they get carried away sometimes. And, you know, they go wide in, in a huge number of choices and, you know, in depth and so on. And, you know, next thing you know, it's like a 300 plus scenes uh, uh, scenario <laughs> that you uh, have built. But um, uh, speaking of choice, I wanted to talk about a company that uh, uh, a lot of you might know, Apple. Uh, they uh, started with one flavor of iPad when it was just launched because it's, it was a new thing and they wanted to concentrate on that choice between getting one and not getting one instead of you know asking you like which kind do you want. And once people get accustomed to it, they gave you a little bit more choice. You know, there's a smaller iPad and a bigger iPad, right? And then the next thing is is, uh, well, now we have like three iPads. There's the huge one as well. Yes. And it took them, what, uh, five, six years to, to get to this point. So uh, I, I think it's, it's the exact uh, uh, situation as with that lady and, and uh, the jam. I think, you know, guys at Apple read that story too. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, this is the exact strategy you should learn. Oh, I, I, I always say, you know, I'm probably not the smartest guy in the room, any room. And uh, I should look at what uh, uh, others have achieved. And I, I tend to look at huge companies like Google or Apple because if they are employing strategy, you know, it's obviously working. Yeah. So in terms of choice, uh, you know, uh, no choice could be bad, but just as bad could be having too much choice. Perfect. I like this idea and even almost having the concept of limited choice at the very beginning and as you get more advanced you get more distractions right so maybe we start with two choices and then we move to five when you're advanced because you're you now have to really get good at decision making but you've had some training this is this is exactly how the better scenarios that i've seen work mm -hmm. Just, you know, maybe no choice, just, you know, one button to uh, make sure you are not lost in the interface, that you know where to click, and then you see that, you know, clicking on that button uh, button advances the story, yeah. and then all of a sudden you have two buttons. So you, you have to do some thinking, maybe those two buttons uh, lead to the same consequence. It's like saying hi versus saying hello. Probably doesn't impact anything, but you're training your learner, you're explaining that, you know, there are choices. And the next thing, the choice is impactful. And the next thing is, you know, there are more choices and so on and so on. So there should be a build-up, uh, ideally.
Awesome. Oh, anyways, I'm excited to, to play. So, <laughs> um, so this software you've developed, um, it's not PowerPoint based. It's in the cloud, HTML5 um, ready. Um, so what drove you to be so progressive and what drove you to develop branch track? It sounds kind of like you were scratching your own itch. <laughs> yes, we, we definitely were, and, uh, but I think the bigger reason is that uh, we had no clue about what e-learning was when we started an e-learning company. It's a whole separate story of how that happened. But uh, So you're uh, saying we, you had no bad habits? No, no. <laughs> we, we couldn't imagine, like, uh, we weren't building on the hundred years experience of you know pushing slides on screen. Uh, we we uh, uh, started uh, from scratch, drawing on all kinds of sources for for of inspiration, uh, but mostly uh, uh, modern internet and uh, video games. And uh, as a result, all of the e-learning that we've built as an e-learning development company was not uh, of the page flipper kind. You know where where you have to just you know, flip pages and click next 70 times and then maybe there is a quiz at the end uh, uh, which kind of checks your uh, uh, goldfish memory like can you remember what we talked about in the past 20 minutes over 40 slides or something so um, having uh, no bad habits not having that background was was really important but uh, when I decided that we have to build a tool that anyone could use because we had a set of you know homebrew tools uh, for building scenarios that uh, only we could use because they were like badly designed mostly coded by me and, and so on when we thought that okay I, I think this is an opportunity I want to build a product that anyone could use I immediately understood that even the uh, technical capacity that we had in our e-learning development company was not enough uh, if, if you compare e-learning to modern web applications you you'll immediately see there's like a 10 years difference be be between those two so uh, I said okay I have to team up with uh, uh, some people who are better at this than we are so um, it took me about maybe a year to, to find co-founders for this company, but uh, now I couldn't be happier. Those guys are just amazing at building software, amazing at designing user experiences, and very efficient at that as well, so they can do that real fast. Uh, so um, I, it was also important to not draw from that e-learning pool of talent, uh, but uh, 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 draw on the web modern web development pool of talent and from e-learning we just took the the pains and the itches and uh, the problems that we wanted to solve and uh, then we started solving them and I think a lot of people like what we do exactly because it solves their problems even in little things we try to kind of save their time and uh, every learning develop developer uh, immediately connects with our software because it's been envisioned by an e-learning developer by me essentially yeah so it's it, basically what I noticed is that um, that you're there is no content uh, really in branch track your content is about the the conversations you focus uh, on those conversations so do you think that does that scare people uh, like you know subject matter experts come in let's say and i'm thinking obviously it's designed so that a subject matter expert can come in and build their own scenarios without having to be a, a, some sort of a, a guru developer um, to do that now oops Oops. No, I had a bit of computer malfunction behind me. <laughs> okay, no worries. So, so. Um, no, no worries. So, you're you're trying to solve your own problems, but then how do you um, how do you overcome the need for some people to have um, to have content in in their uh, e-learning? Um, well, if 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 I understand you correctly. Um, <laughs> You're talking about that theoretical part of training, like the part where we tell people things. Yeah, and, like can you just uh, throw them in and without them knowing all the info beforehand? Um, the answer is yes, you can. 
but uh, <laughs> let's let's put a pin in that. Uh, uh, speaking of, of uh, uh, theoretical part, um, it's absolutely very important to kind of explain, you know, coming like the fifteen strategies that that we mentioned, right? Yeah. Um, you have to explain all of the fifteen at some point uh, before you can expect people to uh, to try them. Mm. So. Uh, uh, you have to to build those slides as well. In branch track, we are focusing on the things that we do best on branching scenarios, and we leave the rest to authoring tools. So, if you use uh, Articulate Storyline or uh, Lectora or Captivate mm-hmm. or pretty much any other e-learning authoring tool, or even if you're building your training in, in Flash and HTML from scratch without any tools, in all those cases, you can embed scenarios on slides. They can become part of that course. So you can have 10 slides on um, policies and then one realistic situation where you ask the learner to actually digest those policies and try and apply them in a realistic situation. And after they failed, uh, you can say, okay, you failed probably because you didn't know this, this, and that. Uh, and why don't you try again, maybe in a different situation or same situation and so on. So you can mix and match scenarios and conventional training, you know, slide-by-slide training quite easily. And I think for us, it's the number one use case. Most of the people who use branch track, yeah. they embed it into Lectora, into Storyline and other tools. So uh, we are very supportive of that. There is a lot of you know uh, technical things we've built to make that easier. Okay. Uh, but uh, uh, kind of uh, coming back to that, uh, uh, throwing them off deep end uh, situation, it's actually a great strategy in learning. We had this one um, uh, course that we've built for a, a cosmetics retail company. And it was distributed to about 500 stores. And uh, it uh, started with uh, uh, one slide where we asked them an open-ended question. What is the most uh, common or challenging objection that you hear from your customers? And uh, uh, probably 90% of them wrote, uh, you know, it's money. Everyone says our stuff is too expensive. It was very, like, upscale chain of, of stores. And, uh, of course, we knew that in advance. So on slide two, we thrown them off the deep end into a scenario with a customer who was saying, like, look, I think your stuff is too expensive. Like, I'm, I'm, I'm not buying it, you know too much. And uh, they had to find a way out of that situation. They had to deal with that objection without any prior knowledge except of of what they know, what they've learned in their workplace. Because obviously a lot of those people weren't uh, newbies. They were like for two, three, four years in in that chain. So um, uh, in in the feedback that we then collected from those people, uh, you know, a few months after, they said, "Wow, that was so amazing! I wrote in plain text about like my biggest fear and my you know scariest objection that I face every day, and then your scenario was centered around that. Wasn't that amazing?" And uh, uh, the, of, of of course, it's a cheap trick, but you know, it worked with with that audience. And uh, the fact that they had to deal with the problem immediately before being exposed to any information also helped us to get on board those people who think they know everything. Because once they failed in that situation, they were much more inclined to learn what happened in, in, as, as opposed to a hypothetical situation where they would have to skip through 40 slides saying, duh, I know all of that anyway, yeah. and then be exposed to a scenario. And then if they fail it, you know, they fail the whole course and, uh, you know, there's no more learning. They have to restart and it's much worse experience than, than, than what we designed. So uh, I think that exposing people to a scenario goes a long way towards their uh, involvement in the rest of your course. So sometimes it's useful to hook them in the very beginning instead of saying, okay, you know, I've spent uh, uh, so much uh, creativity and effort around designing this scenario, so I will put this at, at the end because it's the best part. You know, if it's the best part, you know, bring your best wine in the beginning of the party, right? <laughs> I like this approach, and I like the idea that you said that um, scenarios can be used to help learners who feel they know everything to discover that they don't or that because later that when that information comes 
they're now seeing the context in which they would use it. They're like, oh, okay, well, this lady said this. Okay, here's some of the information I should share with her. And now it means something to me instead of being upfront. So, exactly. so it's almost like you should, you should start every learning situation with a scenario. Ideally, yes. Ideally. I like this. <laughs> okay. So um, now we talked about, you know, the industries that, um, that start... Um, that could use uh, scenarios that could benefit from the use of scenarios. But when you start, when you're starting a scenario project, what's your uh, thinking about your specific process? What's your number one tip for starting a scenario project with your team? Um, my number one tip is start at the end. So, um, well, of course, you know, the topic of your future scenario, right? Let's say it's, um, uh, asking for a raise, right? You, you're, you're teaching your learners Always. how to ask for a raise correctly, right? And this is a challenging situation. There are probably, you know, some decisions to be made within that conversation and so on. Um, but how do you build it? I say start at the end, uh, come up with a few outcomes of, of that scenario. Like what's the worst thing that can happen in that conversation? Well, I know you can get fired. <laughs> All right, that's that's the worst part. Now, what's the best thing? It's uh, you know you get the race. Great. Now, are there like maybe one or two kind of middle ground uh, uh, outcomes as well? Yeah. Well, you might not get a race, or you get a little race, or you get a promise of a race. This is what I used to get. This is why I quit my job <laughs> and you know, started a company. So. Um, uh, start at the end, define those points where your scenario will end and uh, then think uh, what should happen in my scenario to end up in that, you know, getting fired situation. Well, I'll probably have to say this and that, you know, you'll probably have to say a couple of, make a couple of bad choices before you end up in, in, in that particular outcome. Uh, what are the things that I uh, uh, have to do in the scenario to end up in this ideal outcome, you know, getting the race or making the sale or um, like achieving any success in any hypothetical situation. So maybe you have to do three, four, five choices uh, in the correct order, you know, that, that are right choices. And of course, anywhere in between them, you have the mix and match of good and bad decisions that will end up uh, in, in one of those middle ground choices. And uh, uh, when you start thinking backwards, um, it's, it's very easy to build that pyramid. If you think about uh, how a branching scenario looks visually, it, it's like an upside down tree. It starts at the top with the first scene where you start and then you know, it branches out into this huge number of, of, of choices. Um, if you start at the top, um, then you'll branch out into, I don't know, 50 different outcomes very quickly and you will bury yourself under all that amount of content that you have to create. If you start at, at, at the end of the scenario, you say, okay, well, I'm, I, I've now limited my options. Yeah. I have to build the middle part. And that is a huge time saver. It, it defines your whole experience and it's very important to, to know where you end up. Um, kind of like having a plan almost, or, or, or like putting a, a, a mark somewhere, uh, because uh, uh, otherwise it's very easy to, uh, to get overexcited about all the possibilities and uh, start building something that will end up being half finished and you know, will not see the light of day. That's excellent advice, Sergey. And I think that what happens is with something as uh, a beautiful interface like yours, and it's very simple, that you could just keep on building and branching and then like you said that's all every one of those branches could potentially be a another story you have to tell so it's better to keep your story concise and not diluted now i have a question when you um like do you think it's important for people to see that working software right away do you feel like you should like let's say with your team you're working with your subject matter expert you want to expose them to this should you show them scenarios beforehand that you like that to give them an idea of what you're working towards is that a good idea um i think yes uh it's um it's it's very easy to show them a couple of samples which 
don't have to be, it's even better if they aren't directly related to the subject area that, uh, mm. that the subject matter experts are in. Because if, if, um, if you're showing a healthcare scenario that someone built for some purpose in some company some years ago to a healthcare SME, uh, they will start nitpicking. They will, yeah. they will immediately go into the critique mode. Uh, if you show them, uh, what I like to show, and you know, you can find that on on brainstrike.com, is a, a scenario that was built by London Metro Police like ten years ago, and it deals with uh, uh, youth crime, and it couldn't be more remote from what we have to deal with in, <laughs> in, in office environments every day. You no, know, like knife fights and whatnot. Oh boy, yeah. But, <laughs> but it shows the important stuff. It shows the choice. It shows that you are in control of the story. It shows the, uh, the fact that scenarios can be emotionally strong and uh, uh, emotionally uh, uh, engaging. Yeah. But... Um, they they don't switch that you know critique mode in in, in your SMEs. So uh, I say, yep, uh, it's okay to show a scenario, but mm. keep keep in mind that it has to be remote. It has to be abstract enough to uh, to provoke conversation about scenarios as an instructional design tool, instead of you know a conversation of whether that guy's uh, hard hard top hat is you know <laughs> on the right way or something. Yeah, it's. It's it's terrible in healthcare. Uh, 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 people will notice, you know, some things that, you know, you're showing some mock-ups, and the doctor will say, "Well, I, I don't like this. Why?" And and you've spent like forty minutes explaining instructional design stuff. Uh, why? Well, that nurse's nails are way too long for a real nurse. You can I see that she's an. And 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 then you spend the next forty minutes discussing that and and. How you, <laughs> And you lose the SME immediately, and you have to be really aware of that stuff. Uh, so uh, uh, it's it's okay to show, but be beware of of, uh, of of that caveat. I I think that's some of the best advice I've heard about uh, about I'm serious about scenarios because I've been there and I've I've had. Uh, people comment on the uh, sexiness. The nurse was too sexy, and I was like, "What does this have to do with it?" Right? But yeah. it's true. I, I agree. Um, the other thing, um, so w what I found is that uh, what I really enjoy about actually the blog that you have on your site is that you have, um, actually I think if somebody wanted to have uh, show scenarios that are uh, different uh, but show that creativity, show the natural dialogue, there's a lot that you source and kind of gather and you're like, this could be built with Brad Strack, it's awesome, but also check it out, right? Uh, so the blog, I, I will uh, put a link to it because you share a lot of those examples in there that somebody could use before they start. So it's awesome. Yeah. Uh, speaking of those examples, uh, I try to share stuff that uh, hasn't been built with branch track mm -hmm. uh, because there is a lot of uh, interactive fiction on the internet now and there are uh, a lot of indie mini games uh, that uh, are often centered on around uh, uh, branching scenarios essentially and they're very inspirational uh, and I did this keynote recently on, uh, on, on video games that every instructional designer should uh, uh, download and play you know uh, in, the, in a budget of you know under a hundred Bucks, you can download maybe you know five six games, and you will get more value out of that than out of you know any book of, of equal value, uh, and also a lot of fun. Uh, so I try to share stuff that isn't only built with branch track, and for the stuff that is built with branch track, most of that has actually been built by uh, one person. I want to mention him by name. This is Clark Aldrich. He is a senior ga uh, serious games designer. He literally wrote a number of books on, on serious games and scenarios, and he's just great. He's, he's, he's been building branch track scenarios for a long time, and uh, uh, I, they are hilarious as well, because I, I think that's super important uh, to have in scenarios, that realism, you know, uh, that the fact that you know, people who are there, they talk real, uh, the situations feel real, but you also can add a little bit of humor. It never hurts, especially in scenarios. People are afraid of humor, I think. They're just, 
Um, they they are too buttoned up, I think. Yeah. And you can't be buttoned up in, in, in learning. If if you ever go to a face to face session, the best ones are the ones where the uh, the guy in the t shirt and hoodie sits on, on the chair backwards and you know tells you some real stuff. Uh, th- th- those are fun, those are memorable. And also those ones where you're involved. Uh, if, if if you think about it, a lot of e learning is like the opposite of that. You know, it's someone in, you know, tie up here and you know just standing in one corner and telling you and telling you and telling you and you know it's slide 99 out of 150 and (laughs) uh, so you mentioned some games can you tell me like two games that i should as an instructional novice instructional designer should watch if i want to before i start any scenarios what are your top two um uh, top two one of them is uh, fairly recent it's uh, called firewatch and it actually starts with a branching scenario. Uh, it's it's a, a branching fiction story about a guy who watches fires somewhere in Wyoming. It's uh, less of a game, more of a, of a, uh, of a branching story, cool. and it's really beautiful, uh, not too expensive, and it's it's the best use case of of branching scenarios recently. Uh, the other one is uh, uh, called Papers, Please. Oh, yes, uh, I've heard of that one. Oh, yes. Uh, Papers, Please is an amazing simulation of a border crossing guard who has to check everyone's papers. It's a, it's a very insightful commentary on current political situation and so on and so on. But uh, uh, it will also immediately click uh, for anyone who is building training because it trains you on how to be a border crossing guard uh, gradually, slowly, in, in, with great interface through a great story with lots of choices and, and so on. It's, it's super fun, uh, very insightful, and provides more inspiration to an instructional designer than you know, any book you can find. And I have a third game, but I won't tell you which one. Uh, we'll, we'll save this for, for, for another interview you know, awesome. when, when we can really talk about video games. Awesome. So uh, it's funny, you just said, you mentioned a game about Border Patrol, and I was like, boring. And that's what's awesome, is that somebody can take and apply those elements and actually make them. That's... People want to play that. for they, they will pay. They will pay to, yeah. to play that. That's awesome. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So that's next. It was, it, 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 was, it was the biggest revelation for me. Uh, I, got, I got on a plane uh, in Frankfurt and I had like a seven hours to New York and I spent six out of those, you know, being a border <laughs> patrol guy and, you know, the most boring job in the world, just checking visas and passports. Yes. But it was so much fun, so engaging. And, and this, is, this is amazing. You just want to go back to that as an instructional designer and try to understand what is that magic. It's like yeah. being a novice magician trying to decipher David Copperfield's tricks. That's cool. It's like, how does he do that? Because you, know? <laughs> you see the border patrol guys, they're not engaged. They're just like, eh, right? <laughs> That's awesome. Um, yeah. So, Sergey, if somebody wants to learn more about what you do, um, wants to connect, where do they go? Where do they find you? Uh, they should go to uh, branchtrack.com branch as in you know branching scenarios and track as in tracking because obviously as an instructional designer you want to know what the learners are doing within those simulations and we can provide those insights that uh, that you can use either to uh, improve your scenarios uh, further or to actually infer some ideas about what those people would do in real life in, in similar situations. And uh, that's, that's actually pretty powerful as well. We had uh, uh, we, we had experience catching people lying to customers in virtual reality and then finding out they actually uh, have a propensity to do that in real life. Uh, this is kind of information that you can uh, infer from uh, observing them within a scenario, but you can't just ask them in a questionnaire, right? You don't send out questionnaires saying, like, how many times you lied to a customer in the past six months, you know, one to five, five to ten, you know, every day and so on. Actually, that's, so, sorry, I know you're going to, you're going to go, but this is such an interesting concept. I was, because I was questioning this yesterday. But whether ethics, if you're, if you're let's say, um, a racist person and we're trying to eliminate racism or something like that in the workplace, would people be more honest about making the wrong choices um, in a scenario? And you're telling me that this is true, that if somebody has a propensity for something maybe negative, like lying, that they would actually do that more and some of that behavior might show up in real life. So 
you have to be really careful right. with how you set that up. Right, because uh, some people just be try things, right? Yes, yes. Okay. Uh, you, you, you have to be really careful with how you set that up. Yeah. You have to be yeah. really careful with how you interpret that. You have to be really careful with the ethical sides of observing people while not telling them that you are observing them, <laughs> kind of trapping them in those situations. True. Uh, but on the, if, if you have enough data... Uh, if, if you have a large sample of learners uh, and uh, if, uh, if, if you already have some theories that you wanted to test using a scenario, like would they do that if they had this choice? Mm -hmm. Then you can. For example, uh, it doesn't have to be like those difficult things like yeah. lying yeah. or being racist. Uh, it could be simple things like uh, uh, if you're training salespeople, you give them a scenario where they have a choice of saying that they have a special offer. Uh, when talking on the phone to a customer and uh, you will find out that what, what we found out in one of the cases is that uh, people tend to click that button immediately. They think that, you know, mentioning special offer is like a get out of jail free card uh, <laughs> that, that gets them connected to the boss immediately. But uh, in reality, everyone just says, okay, send it by email and hangs up on you. So... Uh, no, I've, I've, I've been a phone salesperson. Uh, Me too. It, it's what happens. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and uh, we were really surprised and our customers were really surprised to find out that, you know, uh, whenever that button is present on screen, everyone is, will, will, will click that, you know, even if they, are, if they know that they're being timed and scored and so on, so they feel that, you know, it's, 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 it's a good option. And they had to design a whole new chapter in, in their sales training on uh, when to use and not to use uh, special offer strategies and so on. Because, you know, special offers also decrease the margin, you know, you can sell yes. something at the yep. whole price but you won't make any profit with it so you heard the company at the end you're so, not driving uh, with value yeah you're driving with price but it's, exactly. but, but it's beautiful what you said because almost like you, when you have software that is so responsive uh, and you I'm, I'm hoping we can do this more in e-learning is to get people to um, build something put it out there see the results and then go back and I mean with branch track it's so easy you're like okay this path is leading people this way and this is the results they're getting but based on our testing we really should be adjusting and refining yeah. and refining and refining yeah. and we don't I don't think we do that enough is go back yeah. and refine and get gather data so so uh, this is the track part of our brand name so we're branch track.com uh, you can uh, you can go to that website you'll you'll find my email pretty easily and I'd be Perfect. Interested in getting in touch with anyone who wants to talk more about branching scenarios. I can do that all day. It sounds like you can. And I've learned so much from uh, this interview and I really appreciate it. Thank you so much, Sergey. No, the, the pleasure was all mine. It, it, was, it was very fun. Okay, awesome. Thank you. So um, I'll talk again soon because I want to find out what game number three is. <laughs> all right, okay. <laughs> Take care. Excellent. Take care. Bye-bye. Thanks for having me. Thanks. Bye. Hey, so what did you think? Wasn't that a fabulous interview? I certainly enjoyed myself. Listen, you have any questions, any concerns, anything you want to discuss, put it in the comments. I want to hear it. So does Sergey, so he can come back and maybe do another interview. Wouldn't that be awesome? Anyways, visit me at elearnerengage.com and visit Sergey at branchtrack.com and I'll see you next time.